Good to see you on a cool, crisp Sunday morning. We're going to start off with silence, pray us in, begin our worship time. Let's go to the Lord. Almighty God, we thank you for the reminder today of the change in seasons. We thank you for the activity and the community, the fellowship that we feel when we walk into this room. Lord, we pray now for you to settle us, to allow us to separate from the things of this world, to focus our entirety and our intention on you. Allow us to hear you speaking to us this morning. Father, we also ask for you to prepare our hearts as we enter into a time of communion in just a little bit, it should allow us to feel your grace and your mercy, and to come before you in confession, and to surrender our lives, our hopes, our dreams, our thoughts, everything that we have to you, Lord. We ask these things in your name. Amen. <laughs> Good morning. Welcome to our service of worship this morning. A quick announcement is uh, this afternoon at 3.30, uh, my wife Penny will be doing the nursing home service. And normally I would be going, uh, except I've started to develop a little bit of a sniffle and I don't want to uh, project that on any of them. But if there was someone that would like or could help her to lead the singing there would be helpful to her. So just if you feel like you could be there for that, that would be very helpful to her. Thank you. Have you ever felt like, oh Lord, I just messed up again? That thought crosses your mind. I know that I do that. <laughs> not, not again, Lord, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to, to do that again. I just did it. There's a really a wonderful uh, quote that I hear coming over the message on the um, Sirius XM, the Christian station, the message. And I love this, it, and it goes something like this. I don't know if I'll get it exactly right. But you may have done countless things to hurt your relationship with God, but none of them has changed his mind. So thank, thanks to God for his grace and love to us each day, and may we worship him in that spirit. Beloved in the Lord, our help is in the name of the Lord, who made the heavens and the earth. May the grace and peace of God our Father 
and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Please rise if you're able for the call to worship. The love of God reaches to the heavens, his faithfulness to the highest skies. His righteousness is like the highest mountains, his justice is like the great deep. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God. Be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Please open your hymn books to hymn number 25, Immortal Invisible. From the earth. Praise him, you large sea animals and all the oceans. Praise him, lightning and hail, snow clouds and stormy winds that obey him. Praise him, mountains and hills, all fruit trees and cedar trees. Praise him, you wild animals and all cattle, small crawling animals and birds. Praise him, all you kings of earth and all nations, princes and all rulers of earth. Praise him, and children. Praise the Lord. He alone is great. He is greater than heaven and earth. God has given his people a king. He should be praised by all who belong to him. He should be praised by the Israelites, the people closest to his heart. Praise the Lord.
Everything good and perfect gift is every good and perfect gift is from God. These good gifts come down from the creator of the sun, moon, and stars. God does not change like their shifting shadows. God decided us to decided to give us life through the word of truth. He wanted us to be the most important th of all the things he had made. At one time you were in the dark, but now you are in the light because of what the Lord has done. Live like children of the light. The light produces what is completely good, right, and true. Find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the acts of darkness. They don't produce anything good. Show what they are really like. It is shameful to even talk about what people who don't obey do in secret. But everything the light shines on can be seen. And everything the light shines on becomes light. That is why it is said, Wake, O sleeper, arise from the dead. Then Christ will shine on you. Of all creation. 
praise you this morning. Thank you that we can trust you, that we can be put into your care. Lord, help us to yield ourselves to that, to yield ourselves to you in all things. We praise you and thank you for your grace and love through your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. Last, the ushers to wait upon us for our tithes and offerings. Um, may we graciously give back to the Lord what he has graciously given back to us.
reading from the book of Micah, chapter 5, verses 7 through 15. The remnant of Jacob will be in the midst of many peoples like dew from the Lord, like showers on the grass, which do not wait for anyone or depend on man. The remnant of Jacob will be among the nations in the midst of many peoples like a lion among the beasts of the forest, like a young lion among flocks of sheep, which mauls and mangles as it goes and no one can rescue. Your hand will be lifted up in triumph over your enemies and all your foes will be destroyed. In that day, declares the Lord, I will destroy your horses from among you and demolish your chariots. I will destroy the cities of your land and tear down all the strongholds. I will destroy your witchcraft and, I will no, and you will no longer cast spells. I will destroy your idols and your sacred stones from among you. You will no longer bow down to the work of your hands. I will uproot from among you your Asherah poles when I demolish your cities. I will take vengeance in anger and wrath on the nations that have not obeyed me. The word of the Lord. So we've been going through the book of Micah. looking at the right view of various things. And so today we look at the right view of God's plans. A little over a week ago, I don't know, 11, 12 days ago, a little tiny section in northern Syria came back into the news. It was a, is a place that if you can kind of close your eyes or imagine your geography caps on for a moment, of northern Syria, borders Turkey, and has very close to it Iraq and Iran. A section of northern Syria was a place that was being carved out by the Kurds for the Kurds with the help, as you've heard in the news, of uh, U.S. military support. It's been a place that has been volatile and coveted for centuries. Now, if you watch the news, you know that um, in an act of desperation as Turkish tanks came into that section. The Kurds, who had been living there, kind of carving out their own section for about four years, again, with U.S. help, decided an act of desperation to make an agreement with Syria, and in essence, Russia. Um, and at the end of this week, uh, Turkey had agreed to a ceasefire for five days to allow the Kurds to leave that area, a place that had been uh, their home for four years. Whether, wherever people fall on this issue, it's an incredibly important section of the world. Again, it's a place that's been coveted and volatile, but to give you just a little snippet of how peaceful that section has been for the last four years, um, it's not too far from Aleppo. Remember Aleppo, which has been attacked by its own area of Syria, its own um, country. And Aleppo was the place that last year was being starved out to flush Syrians out. To the north of that is this little section of northern Syria where the Kurds were, which had, had peace. Okay, what in the world does that have to do with the Book of Micah? That section of the world, Exactly where tanks rolled in is where Assyria is located, was located. That is the place that Micah is talking about. Now, Assyria is going to be larger than that little northern section held by Kurds. It's going to be Turkey. It's going to be parts of Iraq. It's going to be parts of Iran. Another section of that area to the east, less into Turkey, more into modern-day Iraq, is where Babylon was. So these two places where, again, tanks go, where people are fighting over, seems like it is thousands and thousands of miles uh, from us, is the place that you just heard Brian read, that God is going to send a remnant of Israelites to be redeemed. So imagine, if you will, as you've heard for the last five, six weeks, 
Imagine you're a little Israelite, and your life is kind of good. You know, you're living in the walled city of either Jerusalem to the south or maybe Samaria to the northern kingdom of Israel, and it's peaceful. You've got a job, making a nice little living farming. You've got a plot of land. You're eking out an existence. You're hearing all around you that Assyria is building forces and it's getting larger and larger by the day. It's amassing more land territory by either invasions or alliances, but hey, you're good because your government says, no way will they come in to here. I mean, we're God's sovereign nation, so on no planet is anyone going to attack us. Every single day you hear in your Israel Gazette or Judea Gazette that there's corruption on the rise amongst your kings and your priests and your prophets. Every single day you're wondering as you go into places of worship who's on the up and up and who's taking payback so that they can say whatever they have to say to keep the government in power. But again, your life's pretty good. I mean, farmers are getting strapped, they're getting suffocated, the poor are getting poorer. Again, corruption is on the rise and you don't necessarily know who's honest and who's not, but you're safe. And your leadership every single day is telling you that they've been put in charge by God and that if they weren't put in charge by God, they wouldn't have all that they have. And then this guy shows up one day and he says he speaks for the Lord. And he tells you what you know is true, what you've been seeing all around you, but what you really didn't want to give voice to. Yeah, the leadership is corrupt. Yeah, everybody needs to repent. The way that the whole entire government has been run has kind of seeped into all the systems all the way down to you. And even though you seem to be comfortable and okay and your life is good, this guy says God wants your heart. God wants all of your hearts. And so God's grand plan, according to this guy, is not to keep you a safe, sovereign nation, untouched by Syria or Babylon. No, this guy says God's plan is to take you and move you from your house and your land and your country and your family and everything you think is safe and move you into a dark place of the world. But don't worry. This guy says it's going to be good for you because it's going to be in that deep, dark place when you're stripped of everything you've held tightly to. You're going to turn back to God. What would you think? (laughs) That's crazy, right? That's crazy. How on earth could you listen to Micah say that and think, this sounds like a great idea? Imagine if someone came into our world right now and said, everything we know about Christianity in America is just a ruse, right? It's just to keep certain people in power, and God wants true worship, and God wants our heart, and God's answer is to take us and to pluck us back into northern Syria where those tanks went through. And that's God's plan. What would you say? Polite pass. I'm good. Right? I'm really good. Whether it's 730 B.C. or 2019, how do you reconcile God's plan for our life being uprooting and moving us from what is comfortable and what is good and drawing us back into him? How on any planet does that sound like a good thing, right? We've been talking over the last five weeks, as you heard me said in the beginning, that uh, we've been looking at what's the right view of things. And when we look at the right view of God's plan, it looks strikingly different than the right view of, say, my plan. My plan says, hey, God, I want to be comfortable. I don't need a whole big mess of land and house, but I want to be safe, and I want to feel good, and I want to be happy. So what do you do when you live in our skins as Christians. And in our relationship with God, we discover that the right view of God's plan is not to always keep us safe. It's not to make us happy or whole or better, but it's to put us into places where his kingdom can prosper. What happens when when we stand in direct opposition to what we know is a good God and the reality of an upside down world that says sometimes God's plan 
is to place us into areas that feel like we're being stripped of everything we hold sacred. What do you do then? Again, whether it's 730 BC or 2019, the vast majority of the undergirding of how we present religion is that God wants the best for us. And it's not that I think that God wants to do us harm by any means, but, but what does that look like? What's, what's the best for me? I mean, that whole imagine scenario, that could never happen to us, right? We're not some archaic group of individuals that somehow believes God's just there for rainbows and unicorns and to make us happy. I'm not so sure. Let's hear from some pastors this morning, shall we? A few quotes. First one. Creflo Dollar, you know who he is? Out of Michigan, he was on TV every hour in Cleveland. It says, God's trying to put material wealth into your hands. I didn't come here to get anything from you. I'm already loaded. Next one. Leroy Thompson, apostle Leroy Thompson. The Lord told me this is the end time message. He's coming back to look for his church without spot or wrinkle. But one of the biggest wrinkles the church has is being broke. Yikes. Money, come to me now. Kenneth Copeland. I tried that. It didn't work. (laughs) Joel Joel Osteen. God didn't create you to be average or poor. That's good to know. I was worried about that one. Um, How about one more from Joel? I'm not going to tell people that they have to have Jesus in their lives to be saved. Holy cow! (laughs) Our world does not look that much different than 730 B.C., right? I didn't even pick the doozies. But we don't believe that. We don't even know who half those people are, right? Let me give you some numbers this morning. Joel Osteen has 38,000 members in his church. That's more than my town has. 38,000 people. Every book he has written has sold millions of copies. The other guy, Kenneth Copeland, Money Now, has three jets. Just bought one from Tyler Perry. He's on the President's Advisor Council for America. Leroy Thompson, the apostle, flies around, you guessed it, in a private jet, while us little human people fly in coach, if we can afford to fly. Uh, And his, his... Healing is to lay hands on people to relieve them of money woes. And Creflo Dollar, you may not know him, but his World Changers International has an annual budget of $80 million. $80 million. When we look around our world and we say, I could never, ever ascribe to the idea that God just wants me good and God just wants me to have what I want to have. That's not God's plan. That is not what is being perceived in our world as good and successful. Look in this church. Every single Sunday, we preach the gospel. We read the gospel. We talk about the gospel. And we don't have any of those things that the trappings of the world say is what it means to have a successful ministry. In 21 years of ministry, I have heard over and over and over again the link to size in a church to the pastor doing something right. And yet, that's not necessarily what we're told in God's plan. How about one more quote from another pastor? Oswald Chambers. If through a broken heart, God can bring his purposes to pass in the world, then thank him for breaking your heart. How how can you have that difference of opinions of God's plans? What if God's plan is to break our heart? Would we recognize that as God's plan? How do we know what's God's plan? If the world tells us that, that success and security and attendance in church is the trappings of God's plan, and that, that, that shows us success, then how, how do you reconcile this one? Dietrich Bonhoeffer never had 38,000 people in his church. And it was God's plan for him to be executed in a concentration camp. 
What if it's God's plan to break our heart for his kingdom? Because that's God's plan for the Israelites. Would we know it? Would we do it? We just sang, whatever my God ordains is right. right? Remember that last little line? Though my way is dark, I know that I won't fall. Do we believe that? Can we discern that? How do we know what's God's plan? Let's look back to God's plan for the Israelites, beginning at verse 7. There is a what, a where, and a how of God's plan in this section, verse 7 through 15, and I'm going to start with the, the where. Um, first, if you look at verse 7 and verse 8, the first part of both of those verses, God has a direction that he is going to place the Israelites. So part of God's plan for the Israelites is to take a remnant, shaharif in Hebrew. Lots of times people will say remnant means leftovers. That's not what remnant means. Shaharif means, it can mean um, remnant. Uh, most common is rest. It is a protected group. It is not what's left over, it is what God is sending out, and he's going to protect this group of individuals as Israelites while they are in exile. And this remnant, he says, is going to go someplace. This is the where. Um, they're going to be like dew on grass out into the dark places. We know they're going to go to Assyria, we know that they're going to go to Babylon. How beautiful is that, though? The dew on grass. I read that over and over again in the wee hours on Monday morning. That is such a beautiful image. God does not say in his plan he's going to yank them and torture them and send them off packing, and they're just going to wait it out until they get their act together. God says, no, I have a plan for this remnant to go someplace and to be a light to the other nations, to be like dew on the grass, to be used for God's glory. The where, of course, is Assyria. Um, do you know that that section where the Kurds have been located in northern Syria has, as of 2010, 2.5 million Christians? In Syria and Kurd, Syrian Christians and Kurdish Christians. So God is saying, look, this group of individuals is not just going there for a time out. They're going there because they are going to get pulled back into um, into my presence, they're going to be redeemed, they're going to repent, but they're also going to witness. In Acts chapter 15, Jerusalem Council, what they are talking about there is Amos's, who is a contemporary of Micah, talking about the remnant that will go out and preach and teach to the Gentiles. We are in this room because of prophecies like this. Because God says, I'm going to send you to a where. I'm going to send you to a place, not only where you're going to be drawn closer to me, but where you can influence the world around you. That's the where. Look at the what. Second part of that. This remnant is going to be both a blessing and a judgment. So look at the second part of verse 7, second part of verse 8. So we're going to be like dew from the Lord, like showers on the grass. That's the blessing part. As soon as you hear that, does that remind you of anything else in Scripture? Reminds me of two places. First, it reminds me of Paul and Jesus talking about being poured out all the time like a fragrant offering. But the other place it reminds me of immediately where my mind went to when I read it over and over again Monday morning is like manna, right? Remember manna? God takes the Israelites into the desert to pull them into him to teach them how to be dependent and how to trust him. And they want all kinds of food. They want like China buffet and God gives them manna, which you've heard me say this before in Hebrew means what? Like, what's this, right? You come out one day, and it's on the ground, and it looks like dew on the grass. Actually, manna goes on a tree. And then you collect it, and you eat it, and it's kind of sticky, and it comes from God, and there's no way for any of the Israelites to hold on to the dew. They can't hold on to the manna because it disintegrates. So they have to eat it. They only get one day's supply. And what God is teaching them is dependency on him. So God says this remnant's going to go teach what it looks like to be dependent on God because they're going to be the dew on the grass for the other nations. It's such a beautiful image. God doesn't say you're going to come in and you're going to pound them. He says you're going to be a blessing to them. 
You're going to redirect them to me. The other thing he says in that latter part is that there's going to be judgment that is brought through this remnant for the other nations. Uh, verse 8. It'll be like a lion, second part of verse 8, like a lion among the beasts of the forest, like a young lion among flocks of sheep. So this remnant is going to be the conduit through which other nations can see God. And we know this happens, right? We talked about it last week. They go into Babylonian exile, and who becomes a pointer to God in God's plan? Daniel. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And the results of this twofold blessing and judgment, Nebuchadnezzar, of all people, is able to see, wait a minute, I understand now that you're saying there is one God, and Nebuchadnezzar repents for a time. So this remnant is both a blessing and a judgment. Okay, stop there for just a moment and bring it to us. What if it's God's plan for us to have a what and a where, right? For us to be able to look around the world and say, God, you have maybe placed me in a place where you want me to be like dew on grass. You want me to be able to point people to you. And that's, that's part of where you have me intentionally. A lot of times when we think of God's plan, we think we have to go really far out. We have to go to these far off places. You know, maybe go to northern Syria and to preach and to teach. Or maybe go into the dark places like in Vermont. But what if God already has us where we're supposed to be? You know the amazing thing about do? You don't have to do anything to be do. You just are do, right? You don't have to preach fiery sermons. You don't have to stand up for, you know, big beliefs. You don't have to do anything but just be you. Here's the hard thing about discerning now when it comes to God's plan. Because a lot of times it's, it's very difficult for us to know where God has us, if it's just a place he wants us to get through to get to the better part, or whether he has us there because it's his intention. Right? The Israelites thought under their current leadership, that they were living in the light, and yet they were in complete darkness. How many people, I wonder, sit under the tutelage of Joel Osteen? 38,000 people, and hear somebody say that belief in Jesus Christ is an option, and thinks that they're living in the light. The difficult part for us to discern where God wants us to be on our own is that it's not sinful. It's just that we're always going to naturally gravitate to the light that we find the most appealing, right? I can really serve God right here in the comfort of my own home. And maybe the situations that feel really difficult in our life right now is exactly where God wants you. In your families, in your homes, in your job with your relationships. You might be called to go far, far away, but what if it's just right here as God's plan? How do we know that, right? How do we know if it's God's plan? One of the best questions to ask yourself in this first part to ask God about his plans is, who am I pointing to? Who am I pointing to? If you're due, you're pointing to the creator. That's it. Where I'm located in my situation, where am I pointing to? Um, and then another question is, who's getting the glory? Look at verse 9. What Micah will draw us back to is, all of this is supposed to point people to the Lord. It's supposed to point people to the glory of God. Micah says in verse 9, your hand, this is going, bringing into the Lord, will be lifted up in triumph over your enemies. God's plan points people to God. It must have been so frustrating for Micah to be hearing around him false prophets Skew the gospel, skew the word of God, skew what the Lord is, knows is right in order to benefit other people. And Micah is not saying, hey, look, God, come quickly and point out that I've been right all along and they're the ones that, is wrong, that are wrong. No, he doesn't say that. What he says is, Lord, come and point yourself to yourself. It's God's enemies. God's the one to discern that. Our part in God's plan is to point people and here comes the how. That's all the what. Here comes the how. Look at verses 10 through 15. The how that God's plan will be enacted with the uh, remnant in Assyria and Babylon will be through God releasing the vice grip the Israelites have on what they have put their trust in. 
in order to put their trust in the Lord. For five chapters, Micah has said over and over them to them, don't trust your securities, don't trust power, don't trust money, don't trust the walls of your city, don't trust what you think is right, trust in God. And verses 10 through 15 is the how of God's going to do it. God's going to take them out, and he's going to put them in a place where they have lost control of all the stuff that they have built up for security. Look, verse 10 and 11, first place he's going to take them. He's going to take down their military and their power. He says, I'm going to destroy your horses, your chariots, your cities, and your strongholds. They thought they were pretty safe. They're living in a, a walled city in Jerusalem or Samaria. They've got tanks. No, they don't have tanks. They have chariots, right? They have horses. They have all of the stuff that the Lord has allowed them to amass in order to feel safe. Remember last week when God says to them, gather your troops in your city of troops, it's not going to help you. God's going to take all of that out and in order for them in exile to trust only on him. Okay, but I don't have horses. I don't have chariots. I don't have a vice grip on feeling safe in my walled city. No, no. But you know what I hold on to in my vice grip? Security in a nice bank account, a nice job. A nice place to live. None of those things are bad. Horses and chariots and military is not bad. But when you're holding so tight to them that that's where you put your trust in, God is saying, for your own good, I'm going to rip this down. Imagine if any of those guys that we heard all those quotes from woke up the next day in their private jets gone, right? The thing that you think has made you is gone. Um, the securities, God says, no, 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 no. You need to trust in me and trust in me alone. Look at verse 12. Next thing God's going to rip their hands from um, is their witchcraft, their fortune tellers, their sorcery. God's saying, look, you're not going to be able to go to the fortune teller du jour and have them conjure up whatever you want to know. You're going to have to trust in me and me alone. Okay, again, I don't have, uh, I don't do that. That's not a problem for me, right? No, it's not. But how many of us in the God's plan department trust other people's advice over God? I'm not talking about going to people for discernment. I'm saying how many of us fact check God's plan with really wise, loving people in our life who have the best for us who say God's plan sounds kind of insane, right? We don't have to have witchcrafters to go to. We all know those people who are going to tell us, no, 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 God wants you to stay safe. That's not God's plan. And they don't mean ill will. Again, this is different than asking for discernment. We should always ask a group of individuals to pray with us and to help us discern, but that's very different than asking people for permission to step out on faith. There is a reason that Mitch and I never discuss adoption or foster care with people before we say yes to God. Because we have so many loving human beings in our lives that would say to us, you're insane. You're insane. And it's hard to hear God's voice if we go to our posse of safety. God says, guess what? I'm going to just unclench that from your hand. Verses 13, 14, next thing he says is I'm going to rip down your idols. Asherah, pull. Asherah was the uh, girlfriend of Baal. Asherah poles were another way for you to set up an idol. And in the ancient world, they justified their idols like we justify our idols here. They justified their idols so they could hedge their bets on whether they'd get rain, whether they'd have a good crop, whether they'd have safety. God says, guess what? I'm taking all that out, so the only person you trust is me. And we do the same thing. We hedge our bets, Right? We hedge our bets with our money. We hedge our bets with our safety. We hedge our bets with our families. We say, God, you can have 75% of what you want in my life, but I'm going to hold back 25. We hold back our sexuality. We hold back our, our plans for the future. We hold back our life. And we say, God, this part is off limits. This part's off limits. We struggle. I struggle with giving 10% to God, Right? Imagine God's plan being all of it. When God says to us, hey, I have a plan for your life, and we say, yes, Lord, sign me up, we don't get to hold back into a plan B. God says, guess what? I'm taking all your idols. And then last but not least, 
verse 15, God says, I'm going to take away your fear of other nations. One of the constant problems that you've heard me say repeatedly in the ancient world is that there was always a need for the little guys to make alliances with their foreign adversaries. And they would make alliances with places like Assyria or Babylon by agreeing to be their vassal, which meant they had to assume their idol worship. They had to assume their cultic worship. This is a problem when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego say to a Nebuchadnezzar, guess what? We are not bowing down to you. That's no bueno for Nebuchadnezzar, right? He's like, that's not good. Fire, you go. You had two options. You either signed a treaty with a foreign adversary, you became their vassal, you bowed down to them, or you stood your ground and you got annihilated. God says over and over again, do not trust in treaties. Trust in me. Okay, well, that's an easy one for me to say. We don't have that, right? You know how many Christians I talk to who are terrified every single time they read the news? How many of us as Christians feel like we can only trust our security if everything in the world seems to be going well? God says, don't, no, no, that's great. Ultimately, put your trust in me. God's plan to break our heart for his kingdom means that he might most likely put us in places that are uncomfortable, that strip us from what we've held in security so that we know him. Last quote from Oswald Chambers. It says, patience is more than endurance. A saint's life in the hands of God, like a bow and arrow in the hands of an archer. God is aiming at something the saint cannot see, and he stretches and strains, and every now and again, the saint says, I can't stand it anymore. God does not heed. He goes on stretching till his purpose is in sight, and then he lets fly. Trust yourself in God's hand. Maintain your relationship to Jesus Christ by the patience of faith. Though he slay me, yet I will trust in him. What a beautiful image. Have you ever pulled back a bow? I was just saying this morning, I'm a giant wimp. I did it once, and I'm like, I have no upper body strength for this, right? You have to pull it back and pull it back, and you're stretching, and you're stretching, and you're stretching. And there's so many times when we've been in situations of God's plan where you say, this is enough, I can't handle anymore, and God says, no, wait, part of my plan, part of my plan. I I'm not saying that just because a difficult situation happens that is aligned with God's plan, and I don't think it's that God doesn't want good for us. He does. But the difficult part of not understanding that we're the bow and the arrow and not the archer is that we will get to define what is good. Remember, in the great wise redeeming knowledge of God, God thought it was a good plan to put John the Baptist in a place to preach against sin, a place that got him jailed and beheaded. It was God's wise and good and redeeming plan that the Apostle Paul would be broken for the kingdom, that he would be in a place to preach in jail and to convert and be killed. And it was part of God's wise redeeming plan that Jesus Christ die for our sake. So if we're sitting here today, particularly as we go to this table, how do we know? Ask God. How do we know if it's God's plan? Ask him. Ask it. And ask ourselves this morning as we take the bread and we take the cup, ask ourselves, where am I putting my trust? Where am I putting my trust? Have I said that to God? You can have my life like a bow and an arrow. Let's pray. Gracious Almighty God, as we turn now to communion, remind us of your sacrifice. Remind us of what you've done to set us free. Amen.
and invite the deacons to come forward. If you're joining us for the first time this morning, we do communion twice a month. First, we pass out the plates and the cup to you, and the second time we have you come forward. Uh, you're not obligated to do so. If you feel more comfortable being seated, people can bring communion to you. But the act of coming forward is a reminder with our physical bodies of giving God all of that stuff we talked about, uh, namely us, our heart, our lives, in a very physical way. On the night that Christ was crucified, he gathered in the upper room with his disciples. He broke bread, he passed the cup, and he tried to explain to them what must have seemed like a crazy plan of God to have a, a paschal lamb die for their sake, to be redeemed and reconciled back to God. So today, as brothers and sisters in Christ, we come forward in communion. I invite you to come forward.
close in the Lord's Prayer together. Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This is the story about Paul and Silas, and the time that God had brought light into the dark place because of them. They had been preaching God's word to the people of Philippi, and were glad to hear, and where many were glad to hear the good news of the gospel. But others were jealous and suspicious, and used as an angry mob to attack them. A reading from Acts 16, 16 through 34. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening. Suddenly there was a violent earthquake and in the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself, we are all here. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and his household were baptized. The jailer was joyed. Please rise if you're able and we'll close our service singing hymn number 203 and can it be.
Gracious Lord, take us out now into your world. Allow us to be the light and to dark all around us. Allow us to feel your presence and to know the plans that you have for us. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you.